Uh, good evening. Uh, the Spotlight on Seattle Committee is very pleased to present uh, Rob Dunlap tonight, and uh, this is our first live program, I believe, since... Three years. Yeah, three years. Uh, I'm Roger Lee. Uh, I will do my best to fill in and take over the committee's uh, chairmanship from Jeff Graham, who's going on to greater things with the Residence Council. Um, and I'm going to turn the microphone over to him so he can introduce our speaker. Well, this is a real pleasure for me. I think this is the third time I've been able to introduce the speaker. Uh, he uh, has been to Horizon House several times. But I also want to say that I think he's probably our most uh, famous uh, television star <laughs> in the city of Seattle. I think we've probably all seen him a few times on, on Channel 9. Yeah, we appreciate that he's on there at Channel 9. So Ron, Ron is going to speak to us again tonight. And uh, I think he feels real home at home here. So. Uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy it, and then we'll have questions afterwards, and there's also some materials over on the table back here about casting media. So, Rob. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and good evening. It is a great pleasure to be here with all of you this evening. I have so enjoyed the occasions that I've had an opportunity to come and visit with uh, everybody at Horizon House. This is just a really beautiful community, and uh, it's wonderful to be with all of you this evening. So, uh, and great to be in this uh, room. I understand this is a fairly new remodel. It looks fantastic. I was here previously probably a year or maybe more prior to the pandemic, so it's uh, at least been probably three or four years since I've had a chance to visit with all of you. So thanks so much for having me back. I would like to, before we get started, just introduce Ben Derby, a member of our team at Cascade Public Media. Ben's here this evening and in the back. And so if after the program you have questions and uh, you want to talk to me or talk to Ben, uh, you certainly have that resource available to you. So I uh, appreciate so much uh, everybody taking time to be here this evening. So what I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time just talking about uh, media in general, talking about Cascade Public Media, which you probably know better as KCTS 9 and perhaps as Crosscut. And we'll talk a little bit about what those entities are and how they fit into the work that we do as a public media organization here in the community. So. A little bit about myself, I've been with uh, Cascade Public Media for about nine years. I uh, joined the organization after having spent a lot of time in the commercial media space. I worked for Fisher Communications for many, many years, and many of you might be familiar with the Fisher family that owned Como TV here in Seattle, as well as other properties around the uh, Northwest and Western United States. And I spent 22 years working for the Fisher family, and it was really just a great experience and really enjoyed that uh, quite a lot. Prior to that, I was a television producer in Columbus, Ohio, working for the ABC affiliate there. And previous to that, I was an on-air radio personality, personality in big air quotes, uh, because it wasn't, I don't have much of a personality, but I was allowed to be on the air overnight, of course. Um, and, uh, and that was a great uh, opportunity for me to uh, learn about the broadcasting business and, and the things that I wanted to do within it. But I have found a real home within public media for a number of reasons, which I'll talk about a little bit this evening. So I'll begin a little bit about uh, our journey with who we are. And I think that every organization, whether you're a nonprofit or a for-profit entity, should be able to answer the question, who we are, what we do, and why we matter. Those are three pretty essential things that we ought to be able to explain about ourselves. So I'll start with this. We are a multi-platform, non-profit, public media organization. And I say multi-platform because today we are so much more than just what we deliver over a broadcast tower that you're perhaps used to watching on your linear broadcast channel. You tune into Channel 9, you watch uh, the programming that we make available there, but we have also moved a lot of content and programming onto other platforms that you can take advantage of. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. So, uh, as I mentioned, you probably know us perhaps best as KCTS 9, a public uh, broadcasting service member station. We have KCTS 9 here in Seattle, and then we have KYVE in Yakima. 
And so that Yakima station serves all of central Washington, as well as KCTS 9 serving all of western Washington. And then several years ago, we brought Crosscut into the fold, and that was what really came about uh, in creating Cascade Public Media. Crosscut is a, uh, is a public interest journalism website. I don't know if any of you are familiar or read Crosscut on a regular basis, but we try to cover local news and issues really specific to, in large measure, Seattle, uh, but we have been at uh, various moments uh, expanding our work to cover more parts of the state. So Cascade Public Media was created when we brought Crosscut into the fold because we had these two different organizations that served slightly different purposes and different audiences and we wanted to be sure that both of those brands had the opportunity to connect properly with their audiences. I'll talk for just a second about our mission. <clears throat> so our mission is to inspire a smarter world. And so we spent a little bit of time sort of talking about this mission about inspiring a smarter world and what it really means. And we went back to the founding of the organization, which was originally licensed to the University of Washington uh, as KCTS back in the uh, early 1960s. And, uh, and we felt that we really needed to get in touch with why this organization was originally created. It was created to really spread educational content to our community, to broadcast classroom content to a broader audience. And so we thought, what is really behind that idea? And it's really about spreading education and knowledge. And so we keyed in on this idea of inspiring a smarter world that's founded on the belief that a more informed and involved community makes the world a better place. And so our work each and every day is really about how we do what we do in a way that helps make the world a better place. And hopefully we inspire those who watch and engage with our content to go out and do really positive and powerful things in their community. So this is a little bit about uh, who we are. I'll talk for just a quick second here about our core values. <clears throat> we are guided each day by these four principal values. And I'll, I'll talk about them in this order specifically. Community and diversity are really uh, two really key founding principles for us. And I'll talk about each of them uh, a little bit differently. In, in the sense of community, why that is so critical to us is as a public media organization, we're owned by all of you. We are a nonprofit. We're governed by a board of community leaders and individuals much like yourself. And we're here for you. We are here to make sure that what we're doing is actually contributing to the public good. And so community is really at the core of everything that we do. One of the things I tell audiences often when I have a chance to speak uh, with different groups is uh, the really sad fact, and I shared this with uh, Jeff and John and Roger at dinner, is that uh, we are, in fact, the last locally owned television station in Seattle. And in fact, in most communities, your public television or public radio stations are the last locally owned entities in those communities. And this is all across America. In any city you go into, you will find that your public media operation is owned by its community and is there to serve its community. It used to be back in the days, if you remember, the Bullock family had King and the Fisher family had you know, uh, Como and so forth. And, and these were local organizations that really uh, cared about, they lived here, they, you know, they wanted to make sure this place was well taken care of and that they covered this, uh, this region well. And that's just not the case anymore. And so that has really fallen to your public media organizations. Diversity is really about how we make sure that our audience uh, is well served by the content that we create, and that can only occur if, in fact, we have a team of producers and videographers and journalists uh, throughout the organization that really reflect that community, because we know we have a broad diversity of different uh, individuals that make up our region, and we want to make sure that uh, the people working at Cascade Public Media understand those different communities so that we can do a good job representing them. Integrity cornerstone for media. We feel like media does uh, and has such a, an important role in shaping and influencing society and culture that we have to do that with the utmost integrity, credibility, and trust in what we do and in how we relate to our community is paramount for us. And we never want to lose sight of how important that is. And then finally, innovation. We're seeing massive changes that are taking place across media. I don't know how many of you here are streaming content on various platforms, whether it might be Netflix or Hulu or Amazon Prime. Or the whole media landscape is changing very, very dramatically. And so, as a local 
nonprofit public media organization, we too have to think very aggressively about how we will adapt and how we will be sustainable in the years to come. The only way for us to do that is through innovation. And so this is really about building that muscle, that, uh, that capability to constantly reimagine who we are and what we do and why we matter. So with that, I'll talk uh, just a little bit about the media landscape. It has radically changed and it is moving very fast. How many of you remember the days when there were maybe four or five TV stations in the market, right? And you just watched one of those stations, right? So whatever's on is that's what we have to work with, right? And so that is all certainly still the case, but as you can see, on the right side of the screen, we have this environment now that is filled with so many different types of media organizations that you can engage with. I've only listed a small number of different entities that fall within these different categories. So we have things like MVPDs. Uh, that's, a, I guess, an acronym or glorified term for a cable company. But then we have virtual MVPDs, and these are things like YouTube TV where you're getting sort of cable channels, but they're coming over your internet service. There's streaming devices, there are streaming services, there's game consoles that are feeding more content to people that are watching their favorite programs on their game consoles. We've got all types of social media platforms and pipelines, and so the, the environment is incredibly crowded now. And so where we used to be one of a handful of stations that uh, our audiences would engage with. Now it's an explosion of different platforms and pipelines and brands and different places that you can engage with content. And for all the wonderful things about that, in terms of bringing more choice and more uh, uh, different varied content to audiences, it's also very challenging as a local media organization to find where your place is in that world. And so in each of these eight categories I've laid out here, I've only listed just a handful of the uh, small players that are occupying some of those different spaces. So we've gone from this period of really media scarcity to media abundance and just so many options and choices. And that's one of the things that really drives the innovation within our organization is to think about how we are different than everything else that you can get out there. So here's a little bit more about what we do. We're working hard in that environment to expand distribution. It used to be that you received us exclusively through our broadcast tower. And we own the tower, one of the towers, well, there's three towers up at 18th and Madison, just a really short walk from here. We own one of those three towers. And everything we did was really driven by distribution from that one tower. Well, now we certainly continue to do that, and we see that continuing on for many, many decades. We don't see broadcast linear television going away, but it is declining very rapidly. We're seeing audiences really fractionalize across a lot of different platforms. So what we are doing is really developing platforms for our content to appear in places where that next generation of audience is spending more and more of their time. So if you have Roku, you will find us on Roku. If you have Apple TV uh, subscriber or viewer, then you'll find us there. Fire TV, iOS is essentially the Apple products uh, that are not Apple TV, but maybe it's your iPhone or it's an iPad, and you'll be able to watch us on those devices. Android TV, uh, kcts9.org, if you've gone to our website, you'll see that it's a very different sort of experience now. It's really the station that you can engage with more than a website that is about the station. So we have been moving very quickly to try to make sure that we make your experience in any platform that you happen to engage with one that is very consistent with what you would get if you were watching us in a linear broadcast environment. KCTS9 Passport, I'll mention. How many uh, of you might uh, be aware of Passport? Okay, oh, that's great, lots, lots of folks, that's wonderful. So uh, Passport is essentially our streaming service. If you're a member, you have access to Passport. It's a benefit to you. It's sort of uh, the modern day version of the tote bag. If you become a member, you get access to Passport. And so uh, we are always working at trying to improve and strengthen Passport uh, to make that a better experience for all of you. But it is essentially the streaming service that we bring forward for public television um, much like a Netflix or an Amazon Prime or, or Hulu experience. 
And then, of course, we are moving more and more of our content through a variety of different social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn and Pinterest and Twitter and so on and so forth. So we have found our field of distribution has expanded significantly with technology, but that also is even more challenging to sometimes find the right audiences for your content because there are so many different media organizations and platforms out there to work with. The other thing we're doing is we're working at expanding our content. We're working at finding ways in which we can diversify the content that we bring to our community. So I'll spend a little bit of time on this slide and talk a little bit about the ways that we bring content to our community. It's really three principal ways. Through the network, through acquisitions, programs that we purchase, and then through original productions. So I'll start with our PBS content. Most of you are probably very familiar with some of your favorite shows on PBS, whether that's a masterpiece you know, theater on Sunday nights, or it's Monday Night's Antiques Roadshow, or um, Nova Nature, uh, any of those kinds of programs we receive through PBS, and that is a part of our membership as a PBS uh, member station. And that makes up a fair amount of our programming schedule. We still run a lot of kids' content during the day. There is no universal pre-K in our country, and so our kids' programming is all curriculum-based, and it's all there essentially to provide families with educational content for the kids, to really ready them essentially for kindergarten and first grade. And so we receive all of that content through PBS as well as the programming you're probably more familiar with uh, in the late afternoon and evening hours. In the middle section, you'll see a logo there for APT and BBC, and then you'll see a globe there, my, my terrific clip artwork. Um, I'm not very good at PowerPoint, but uh, we acquire a lot of content. So we actually go uh, into the marketplace and we actually look for programs and acquire them. So I'll, I'll bring up Rick Steves for a moment. Rick Steves is a program that airs on public television all over the country, not a PBS show. He's a show that's distributed by this syndicator, APT, American Public Television. And so Rick produces his own show. He works with APT to distribute that show, and then we acquire that show from APT. And that's the same with BBC World News or America's Test Kitchen, some of these programs you might enjoy. We acquire those shows from APT. Now, the globe is there because more and more we have spent time going out into the international marketplace and looking for content that we can acquire and bring to our community that our community might not have otherwise. And so right now, we have a cache of international broadcast programs that were acquired from, continent, from, from every continent across the globe. So we have programs, I've, I've listed a few of them here from, from Israel and Canada and Germany and so forth, but Ivory Coast, uh, uh, countries in South America, we're bringing a lot of international content uh, to the station. Now, most of that content, we're moving into the Passport environment. We're making that available to you if you're watching through Passport. Uh, a little bit less of that content is uh, making it onto the broadcast, and, and that has to do with just rights issues and rights distribution <coughs> issues. But I, I did sign a deal today for a program from Poland that we're going to be bringing uh, you know, to, the, uh, to broadcast as well as to our streaming environments. And then finally, uh, on the far right there, uh, the original programming that we create from KCTS9 and Crosscut. And these include programs like Moss Facts Northwest, uh, our science show Human Elements, uh, Made There, which is a show that's all about local craft uh, makers here, making candles or making soap or making just different products, small business owners who have created their own business. And uh, so we uh, do a series that highlights their work. Uh, Black Arts Legacies is a series we created uh, last year that is really all about the legacy of what uh, the African American artists in our community have contributed to our culture and society. And we've got a second season of that coming up soon. And I'll comment a, a moment here on our Washington Recovery Watch. This is, uh, we started an investigative news unit uh, about this time last year. We have about three team members now that are doing investigative journalism. And one of the first projects we embarked upon was an investigation into how federal funding that was distributed through the PPP loan program and through all of the pandemic recovery and relief work has actually filtered into communities throughout Washington State. We wanted to get a look and say, what are people really doing with this money? Is this money really contributing to the good of their society and what they said they were going to do with it or not? And so the Washington Recovery Act program, our watch program, was really originally created to investigate that, and that program continues today. So we have found 
you know, great successes uh, in how uh, different communities and organizations and companies have used those resources, and we've found some real abuses. And so we feel like investigative journalism is a really important part of a healthy democracy and making sure that uh, to the extent you see journalism as the fourth estate, it is there to make sure that we are uh, you know, keeping tabs on how our uh, society is functioning and working. And so these are really the three ways in which we uh, you know, we bring content to our community through PBS, through acquired content, and then through original productions. And this is a growing area for us. We see an important part of our role as convening our community around the social and civic issues that matter. I think we know that we are at a, in a time where more and more divides seem to be cropping up in our society. And we see it as an important role as a public media organization to find ways to bridge those divides, to bring people together around issues. Not necessarily to try to get everyone to agree about their point of view on an issue, but to hear one another and to learn from one another and to and just to understand and, and, and make one another think a little bit about some of the subjects that uh, we're dealing with in our society. And so for that reason, we've created a variety of different events that our community can take part in. The Crosscut Festival is really one of our biggest events that we hold each spring, usually the first week of May, and it's essentially a news festival. We have in the past taken over the campus at Seattle University and we program about six or seven different tracks uh, within different areas. So we might have a whole track that's about the environment, and we might have a whole track that's about social justice, and we might have a whole track that's about business. And within each of those tracks, we will program six, seven, eight different speakers and panel discussions and opportunities for people to engage around a lot of this content. We've had some really terrific speakers. We bring in folks uh, nationally as well as locally. So this last year, uh, and of course over the pandemic, it's been a bit of a hybrid, in, uh, you know, a hybrid sort of festival. Uh, at, I think a couple years ago, it was 100% virtual, of course, with, uh, with COVID uh, being what it is. This coming year, this coming May, we will have a better mix of both virtual as well as in-person events. But we had uh, Dr. Fauci uh, this past year, Amna Nawaz, who is now the primary anchor at uh, PBS NewsHour, uh, Carl Bernstein, we had Matt Damon uh, this past year, we've had Nancy Pelosi, we've had just uh, everything, folks from the world of politics, the world of science, the world of uh, business, uh, all across the field. And so we really love the festival for what we hope it can do in terms of bringing communities together around big ideas that help people go out and do really positive things with that in the world. Civic Cocktail is a partnership we've had with CL City Club in which we monthly get together around kind of the social or civic question of the day. It might be homelessness one month, it might be um, you know something totally different the next month. But we shoot that uh, series uh, live in person, and then we turn that into a broadcast program. So in each of the areas that we're working, we're trying to find ways in which we can produce a show, create an event, create a podcast, something you can listen to, and then something you can read, like a newsletter or an article that we might hear on, on uh, or place on CrossCut. So other things like the KCTS 9 Book Club and Food for Thought are ways in which, Food for Thought I really love because it, it uses food as a way to unite people. And I think everybody loves to eat. And I think we learn a lot about one another through the food that we eat and through uh, sharing a table together. And so this is a program that is really about that idea about sharing food together and also big ideas. And so uh, events are really becoming a more significant part of what we do as a way to really unite our community and kind of bring people together uh, in otherwise uh, heavily divided times. So uh, where we're going? Oh, so I'll talk for a really quick second here about um, you know, how we are funded. This is an important, uh, I think, slide. Everyone's interested in this, our, our funding sources. So I'll, I'll really focus on the pie chart on the far right-hand side. So a large amount of our funding really comes from individuals. It comes from you and me and uh, you, you know others in our community who are simply members or major donors. They write a check because they you know support the work that we do and they support the mission and they appreciate uh, the programming and the content. So the majority of what we do uh, comes from individual contributions. Grants makes up the second largest portion at 17%. Now a, the, a very big part of that number is the funding we receive from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. You see this a lot on the air, right? This program is made possible by viewers like you. Um, 
and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And so we have about, so the Corporation for Public Broadcasting is a private nonprofit that is wholly funded by an appropriation from Congress. So it does operate as its own separate nonprofit entity. It's not a department of the federal government, uh, but it does receive funding from Congress. And every public radio and television station uh, makes an application on an annual basis for a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And to receive that grant, we have to, of course, comply with many different requirements uh, as you do when you make applications for grants. And so uh, there are no assurances. It's not an entitlement. We make an application and we have to fulfill uh, certain requirements in order to receive that funding. I think our, uh, our grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting is about 10 to 11% of our overall funding. So it's material, but it's but we're still raising you know 90 percent of our support from our community. A small amount from corporate support, a smaller amount from events. Our other category is made up really of things like investment income off of the resources that we have in operating reserves and so forth, and from our tower leases. So I mentioned our tower up at 18th and Madison. We are a uh, bit of a critical communications hub for a number of different uh, municipal and state agencies in our region. So uh, it's a very interesting, if anyone is interested in doing a tour out there sometime, our engineer loves to take people to the tower and tour them through the tower. You wouldn't think it's very interesting, but it's actually really fun. So up there we have uh, both KUOW and KEXP are tenants on our tower. And then we have other organizations like the Puget Sound Emergency Radio Network, which unites first responders across multiple counties to make sure that they're all in communication with one another when there's a multi-county crisis. Uh, we have the Washington State Patrol, we have UW Police, we have the backup communication systems for King County Metro. So we have uh, relationships with all of these different municipal, state, and county agencies and we have lease agreements with them. And so they provide funding, essentially, that ends up helping to support our overall mission. So it's a really uh, terrific relationship. Um, I won't really spend time on the net asset side of this. Uh, that's not super exciting, but uh, I, just to say that we do have an organization that has been strengthening its financial uh, performance over the last uh, number of years, and so we're in a really good financial solid position. We work really, really hard to make sure we're good stewards of the resources that we receive from our community. So, um, the five pillars of our strategic plan. This is just to give you a general sense about how we think about how we run the organization. So, I'll focus on this in two parts. The top portion, one, two, and three, are really the ways in which strategically we think about our relationship with the community. Number one, engage and reflect the community. That's like our important key strategic initiative around how it is that we connect with our community and make sure we're listening and we're responding and we are engaging properly. Second is about building audience. We know that we have to constantly be in a state of continuing to attract that next generation of public media consumer and continuing to expand our audience through great content and through innovative products, which is part of the reason why we've started to expand so much into so many of the different streaming platforms and so forth that I just shared with you a moment ago. And then the third piece is saying, if you love what we do, then will you support us? And it's really about making the connections between how our community engages with us, watches, reads what we do, and their support for our work over the long term. The bottom portion really is about, number four and five, are really about running a great organization. How is it that we can bring a great team together, grow that talent, and have a really powerful culture that helps us, particularly on the innovative innovation front, and then pursuing operational excellence. We want to make sure that we're doing everything we can uh, to be great stewards of those resources and to uh, stamp out bureaucracy and inefficiency and anything that would cause us to waste a, a single dime. So uh, our teams are really focused in each of these different five areas. But we have one really, really big challenge that we are dealing with right now. Have I teached you well? Um, so, as many of you might know, uh, we have been located at the corner of 5th and Mercer for 38 years, uh, under a 40-year land lease. So, 
uh, sadly, after 40 years, we are being forced to move. Now, this is an interesting story because we uh, own our building at Fifth and Mercer, and, and uh, I think probably many of you have been there. We don't own the land. The land is actually part of Seattle Center, and it's owned by the city of Seattle. And they have determined that they would like to redevelop our corner <coughs> in addition to redeveloping the parking lot that's to the south of us, as well as Memorial Stadium. And so, uh, we have been informed that we have to evacuate, essentially, our corner. I think it was my second day on the job I got this news. So, I've had some time to process this, and we've had some time to work on it. It's been a challenge, but we have been working on this for some time now. But, it's a really sad moment, essentially, for the organization, because we, you know, our donors, our community, built that building. And yet, the city is not obligated to buy that building from us. Our lease actually obligated us to tear down that building and return that piece of property to its original state, which was essentially an empty field. Now, we've successfully managed to get out of that obligation uh, with our negotiations with the city, but we're losing a really valuable asset to this organization uh, that we've benefited from for many years, and frankly, that the community uh, contributed to building. So, it's been a challenge, but the good news is that we have found a new home. It's even closer to Horizon House than where we are today. It's at 316 Broadway. It's at the corner of Broadway and Boren, so it's just a little bit south of Seattle University, close to Swedish, close to Harborview, uh, just a little bit north of the Central District and the International District. It's really in a great spot. Uh, you see a small picture of it there. It looks really large, but it's actually smaller than the building we're in today. Our current building is about 55,000 square feet or so, over two stories. Uh, this building is four stories and about 45,000 square feet. So the footprint each on each floor is a little bit smaller. The nice thing is we have this really big terrace on the second floor, which will be really terrific when all of you come to visit us and spend time uh, out on our terrace uh, in the evening. This is a building that was originally owned from, by Child Aid, if you remember the Child and Family Services Organization, and has historically been on this site for more than 100 years. And their programs and initiatives have all changed, and so they decided to transact on this building and, and sell it. And we were very fortunate to be able to uh, come in and, and, and purchase this building, and we closed on this property at the end of June of, uh, of this year. And I can uh, talk a lot about those dynamics. But part of what we are envisioning here is a space, particularly on the first floor, that will really be dedicated to not just television production and production studios, but also dedicated to bringing our community together. We have two really large spaces that we plan to build into this first floor that will be about gathering our community together around uh, so many of these issues. We see ourselves uh, as important community builders, as uniters, bridge builders, and so forth, to bring those divides together. And so this space will be able to accommodate a lot of that work. So we're looking for flexibility so every space that's an event space will also be a production studio, a television studio, so we can take great ideas that we we bring together from our community and actually send those out to the world uh, through our various distribution channels. So we're very excited about this property. We're disappointed, obviously, to lose the facility we've been in for so long, but we really uh, see a really terrific opportunity at where we're headed. So here's a few renderings of some of the space. We're still working on many uh, parts and pieces to this plan. Uh, you see some renderings of our entry and lobby way. Uh, here's a really kind of ghostly look of our event space. I hope it looks a lot more than that, but, uh, but that's, uh, you know, these artistic drawings before. Yeah, but you guys have a beautiful, you know, uh, setting here, so we can learn a few things from what you've got done here. So we're still working on finalizing a number of these things. You see our outdoor terrace there. Uh, you, you know, the previous picture, I'll go back to this for just a second because you'll appreciate this, the, the green turf that you see there on the terrace. So, because Child David owned this building and it was a child and family service, the first floor is filled with classrooms because that's how they used the facility for the kids. They came in and, and you know, learned at their classrooms and so forth. And so this second story was all a playground. And it was filled with playground equipment, which was a lot of fun. Um, and we have donated all of that equipment to um, uh, I think a local church uh, came in and took all of that equipment. We've donated a lot of the other classroom uh, fixtures and so forth to the Seattle Children's Museum and to other places. We're trying to find as many homes for that kind of material within the building as possible so it just doesn't end up in a landfill. 
basically. So uh, we've been working really hard at trying to repurpose as much of that as we possibly can. So anyway, we are in the stages now of working through what the interiors will look like. Over the last couple of days, we've had a couple of demo parties where some of the team members on the staff have come in and swung some sledgehammers and knocked down some walls and so forth. But we will really start um, construction in earnest probably in mid-February. Um, now, I know as soon as I say this, you're going to laugh, but uh, contractors are telling us that we'll be moving ready September 1st. Uh, yeah, that's so, yeah, yeah, exactly. kind of how we feel about it, too. Uh, but we do have to be out of our place by the end of December, so we have a real hardcore deadline uh, for being able to get out of Fort Worth and get to 316 Broadway uh, over the course of this year. So uh, we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Here's a little bit about our budget on that building. It's a $40 million project. Um, we have financed about 17.25 million of this. Um, we uh, we did our financing package uh, back in uh, February. Or, I'm sorry, back in uh, January of last year because we were concerned about what we were seeing with interest rates and worried about what the Federal Reserve was going to do. And sure enough, of course, this year, as you all know, this last year, uh, they've made significant uh, movement with federal uh, with the federal funds rate, and so. Uh, we were fortunate to be able to lock in our financing um, in January of last year, but hold off the closing of the building until six months later. So we didn't need the money earlier than that, and so we didn't want to have the carrying cost of a big loan, but uh, we were really fortunate to be able to get a 2.3% interest rate, which today would be about 6.5 if we were doing that deal today. So uh, we were really happy with that. So um, we are... Um, we are running a capital campaign right now to raise about twelve and a half million, and that twelve and a half million will help us build out the interiors for the studio spaces, the event gathering spaces, our newsroom, uh, all of those podcast studios, all the kinds of things that we need in order to be able to do our work. And so we're in the throes right now of of raising twelve and a half million. We're about halfway there now, so we're kind of um, around six around six and a half, I would say, uh, to that number. Now, part of that includes a grant that we've been uh, approved for or recommended for uh, by the Building for the Arts Commission, which is a state agency that looks at various projects coming from arts organizations and then makes a recommendation to the governor. And they have a budget of $18 million that they propose to the governor uh, for inclusion in this year's uh, legislative session. Uh, sadly, that's 32 organizations uh, that will receive some portion of $18 million. Sadly, the governor went in and just kind of uh, drew a line and cut about a third of those projects out, of which we were one of them. So we have been spending some time on the phone with our legislators and trying to say, hey, you know, this is our situation, and, and we're hoping we might still support the original plan put forward by the uh, Building for the Arts Commission. And uh, we've been getting a lot of really positive feedback about that. I, apparently, this isn't the first time this has happened. Uh, and so we hope that we will still be successful at uh, getting that grant because it will be a big part of our support. It's about a million dollar number, uh, which is a big part of, of, of course, 12 and a half. So if any of you have great relationships with your legislators uh, and you want to make a phone call, we would appreciate that. But um, so anyway, this is a little bit about the campaign that we are running right now. And, um, happy to take any questions about that. Um, so, those are my formal remarks, but I know that uh, each time I visit with you, I know that everyone is always interested about programs that are coming down the pike from PBS, right? Uh, like, what is coming up? So, I, uh, my glasses on for this, because, uh, so PBS, I, I have the great fortune of serving on the board of directors of PBS, and so I've been very sort of involved with PBS, particularly over the last, say, four years that I've been on the board. Uh, and so uh, we have the opportunity to spend time, um, you know, uh, I'm back in D.C. frequently and, and uh, visit a lot with the leadership of PBS and spend a lot of time with uh, the programming folks there. And so um, there's, a, there's a few really good things. I, I know we probably have some Call the Midwife fans in here. So season 12 is coming back on March 19th. Um, so eight episodes, uh, and actually, so so March nineteenth will be a big night for Masterpiece because we'll have season uh, twelve of Call the Midwife. Uh, Sanditon will be back for uh, season three on that night. That is the final season for Sanditon, so it will sunset uh, after this season. There'll be six episodes of that, and a really interesting show, Marie Antoinette, at ten o'clock on uh, the nineteenth of March. It's rather racy, as racy as people. 
uh, but um, but that's an eight episode uh, drama that will be uh, on March 9th. Uh, we do have a documentary on the 21st of March uh, about Dr. Anthony Fauci. Uh, he allowed cameras to follow him for about a year or so, and so we will have that documentary showing on uh, March 21st. A really interesting documentary called Movement and the Madman uh, in March, and that is about this period in 1969, two of the most significant protests that have occurred in the United States, uh, really around the Vietnam War, and the, the, the one the occasion that caused really Richard Nixon to cease his plans to expand uh, the United States involvement in Vietnam at that moment in time. So uh, that will be a really interesting uh, documentary, I think. Um, let's see, a few other things. Oh, uh, Tom Jones um, in April. Uh, this would be the Henry Fielding uh, version of Tom Jones, not the Welsh singer. Um, so uh, there's a four-part masterpiece uh, drama on Tom Jones, which will be really good. Um, were any of you by any chance at our studios uh, for the Legacy Circle lunch when we uh, had Scott Yu from Now Hear This uh, by any chance? Okay, so Great Performances has a program called Now Hear This, and it's a really, really great show, uh, but it is coming out on um, April 14th. Um, four episodes. It's a wonderful show where he's uh, Scott Yu is a violinist, he's a conductor at the uh, Orchestra of Mexico. Uh, for uh, 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 Mexico City uh, Orchestra, and uh, he just does a really, really great job of, of connecting with artists uh, all over the world, and it's a really fabulous show. I really encourage you to check that out if you have a chance. Um, now, I know, uh, let's see, there's a lot of Ken Burns fans uh, probably here. Everyone wants to know what's happening with Ken. So Ken's got a really, I've got the Ken Burns pipeline here, uh, which is always extensive, and there's one aberration in it that I think is fascinating as well. But uh, this fall, Ken's got a documentary coming out on the American Buffalo, um, which looks really good. Um, he's got two projects coming out in uh, 2024, Henry David Thoreau and the History of Crime and Punishment. Um, and his 2025 uh, slate includes uh, the, the American Revolution, uh, which I'm really excited for. I think will be fascinating and Leonardo da Vinci, which is a bit of a departure for him since he tends to really dig into the American history as opposed to thinking about some of these other, other, uh, other areas. Um, let's see, uh, this summer, Endeavor, season nine, uh, will be out the last season before Endeavor, uh, unfortunately. Yeah, I know it's sad, uh, it's a great show. Uh, Grandchester season eight, Unforgotten season five. Um, anybody remember the show World on Fire? Um, World War II drama. Uh, season two will be out uh, this fall, uh, so uh, I'm excited for that. In fact, my wife and I were talking about that just a week or so ago. My wife is over here. Monica, if you want to just come in and say, yeah, there's <laughs> um, So we were talking about just like a week or so ago, like, I wonder where, I wonder where World on Fire is. Where is we're going to go to season two, so it's coming this fall. Uh, Professor T, Hotel Portofino, uh, both coming out this fall. Uh, if anybody saw The Mystery Before We Die, season two of that will be out as well. Um, so let me see. Oh, here's, here's some stuff that's uh, kind of interesting. Um, so Miss Austin is a drama that will come out in 2024. It's based on a book by the same name. Anybody have has anybody read that book? Okay, so that's in the pipeline as well. That, should, that looks really good. Some of you might remember the uh, early 1970s uh, show, How Green Was My Valley. Yeah, remember that Richard Llewellyn book uh, from, from years earlier? Uh, so that is in the works as well. And um, another season of Cobra, Royal Flying Doctor Service, did we watch that uh, original show? Yeah, so we'll be a season two of that, not until 2024, so we'll go over the time on that. Um, and then Sherlock's Daughter, kind of a variation of, uh, yeah, that's going to be another, uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, anyway, just a few things that are coming down the pipe from, uh, from, from the people. Schedule. So, uh, once again, thank you so much for the opportunity to be with all of you. I'm always so impressed with this community because you uh, come together, you, you run this place and make this place what it is. And community is really so critical in this day and age. And I'm just so grateful to all of you for uh, your support and for having me here this evening. So, thanks. I'd love to take some questions. Yes, sir. Talking to the members of Ways and Means in the house. Yeah, we'll get you a microphone. Yeah. Talking to members of Ways and Means uh, in the House uh, or in the Senate. What's the title of the item? The 
is necessary in order to expand this amount available to DCTS. Okay, so the question was uh, in terms of what's the uh, title of the, the uh, grant program that we applied for with the state? How do I address the legislature with uh, this item? Yes, Building for the Arts grant. Just, yeah, if you refer to it as the Building for the Arts grant, uh, that will that will do it, that will trigger it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Do you foresee Dr. Martin coming back? Oh, sadly, no, I don't. I know, everybody loves Dr. Martin. I know, uh, sadly, I don't. Um, I wish Martin Clunes would come back to do another season of that. I, I could see some specials on the horizon, but I don't know that we'll get any regular series from Dr. Martin, sadly. He's so great. I think that uh, Channel 9 is a tremendous resource, but if I were looking for ways of improvement, I'd look local. Now, I mean, when I see or hear crosscut and mossback, I look for things that will take three or four minutes that I can do so I don't have to withstand it. And I think the best example of that is the person on the news hour who comes on twice and who seems to be very adept at smiling. And so she smiles regardless of the content of what she's talking about. Yeah. And I've even found myself wondering, is anybody at Channel 9 looking at Channel 9? Because I find it irritating, and I assume other people must also. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Hey, all feedback is a gift. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yes, sir. Um, Will the last season of Seaside Hotel turn up on Passport? Yes. <coughs> yes. When? I don't know. <laughs> but okay. I, I can find out. I'll let, uh, I'll let you guys know. Uh, one other question. Yeah. Um, Politics Monday seems to have disappeared from yeah. the news hour. Is that a conscious decision? Or does anybody know? You know, I don't think I know the answer to that question. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll check on that as well. I'm not really sure why that happened. But yeah, yeah, I've heard that a few times. Uh, that's, it's still doing the Friday one, but not the Yeah, it's still doing the Friday, but not on Monday. So, uh, yeah, I'll look into that. I, you know, I, I talk regularly with Sarah Jess, who's the executive producer of PBS News Hour, and I'll ask her what has happened to that. That has just come up actually a couple of times, and I think it probably occurred with the transition from Judy to uh, to, to Jeff and Amna. So, um, you know, I think I know they've been going through a number of different things. I was fortunate to spend a little bit of time in December with Judy uh, back there as, you know, we were sort of wishing her well. Um, and uh, and uh, and so I know the producers there have been looking at a variety of things in terms of the show and how it's structured. So, uh, but I'll make sure to share that that's um, a missed feature. By the way, when I was speaking with Judy, uh, she was talking about coming out here and spending some time in the Northwest. She's actually going to do some projects for News Hour, so we will still see Judy on the air from time to time, and, and hopefully she will make her rounds throughout the U.S. and, and, and her plan is to come out here to the Northwest too. Uh, but but I will check on that. I would at least you know, share that feedback with them. A couple of things. I'd like to second the, uh, the enthusiasm for a local news panel, mm -hmm. the way the Barry Bitsman used to have one yeah. with Joel Connolly, and who's still on CrossCut. Yeah. And other people who are still available and very interesting. I think that would be a real contribution, um, that combination once a week. Yeah. Um, I get lost in all the platforms you've yeah. shown. Yeah. I can't even figure out which are cost centers and which are profit centers. Yeah. <laughs> For example, I don't know whether when something is shown on YouTube that was originated here, you pay for that or they pay you to show it. Yeah, yeah. And it looks like that work. Yeah, it is super confusing for sure. Um, so we generally do not pay for any distribution on any other platform. So uh, when we develop our technology for say, like we've developed the technology that makes up the app that you might download if you are on Apple TV or you're on Roku or any of these other things, we will develop the technology behind it, but we don't have any obligation to for that app or for that content to appear on that platform. Uh, in the case of, for example, YouTube TV, we work across the entire public broadcasting 
system uh, in order to make every local station available on YouTube TV, for example. So uh, that is done in concert with the leadership team at PBS. So they work really hard to make sure that local stations have a presence on these various platforms, but there is no cost to us. So uh, we actually, our distribution cost is actually quite low. You know, we own our tower, uh, so we pay energy costs to keep a transmitter running there for sure. Uh, we pay technology costs just to develop uh, apps so that you can watch on these various platforms. But for the most part, we're not paying like any sort of swatting fee or sort of uh, royalty or licensing fee in order to appear on those ones. That's awful. It's a confusing environment out there for sure. It's so hard to figure out. Like, if I'm watching on this, then, then what about that? I mean, I know a lot of people bring up questions about like, Amazon Prime and like, there's a masterpiece channel on Amazon Prime. What's that all about? How are you guys connected to that or not? And in that case, we have no relationship to the Masterpiece channel on Amazon Prime. So that's an arrangement that's done between Masterpiece, which is owned by WGBH in Boston, and PBS and Amazon. And so that content is made available there. If you subscribe to that channel, then funding from your subscription goes back to PBS. And PBS uses those resources to, in turn, create more Masterpiece content. Uh, but your local station doesn't see any benefit uh, from that. And in fact, you know, uh, one of the arguments we make is that but some of our audience is now getting content over on the Masterpiece channel on Amazon Prime instead of getting it from KCTS9. So it ends up becoming a competitor even if it does help fund some of the content. Um, do you I'll coordinate you programming with uh, the Tacoma channel? Okay, so great question. So a lot of people ask about the Tacoma Channel. So KBTC is licensed to Bates Technical College. Uh, it is another type of PBS member station. Um, they are what is referred to as a PDP. It's a program differentiator uh, product, I think it's called. Um, and so the way that arrangement works is that they have access to about 25% of the programming content that we have access to from PBS with a requirement that they air it at least eight days after we do. Okay, so it's a little bit confusing, but it, there are 17 markets in the United States in which there are two PBS member stations in that market. And one is usually what's kind of referred to as a primary or what we call NPS station, and one is a secondary or PDP. So we are the NPS or primary station in Western Washington, and they are the PDP station. We have a really good relationship with them, but they're totally different. Uh, we don't coordinate programming with them. They are naturally obligated to air a lot of programming at different times just simply based on their relationship with PBS and, and the obligations that they have to that. Um, so uh, they tend to do a lot of work in the education space, more so while we're doing more work in civic and civic affairs and, and that sort of thing. So, um, Really great team down there, uh, but it's a totally different operation uh, than, than ours. And in fact, about, about you know, I see Ian Hamilton, who's my counterpart down there, usually once a year in Washington, D.C., when we're talking to our legislators on Capitol Hill. That's about the, but they're really great. Yeah. You said civic, so you've, uh, that's a good segue. So my question is because of where we live, if we want to go to Civic Cocktail, you know, we can go out the back door and we're yeah, at town right hall, down, like in about two yeah, minutes, that's right. maybe a minute and a half if the lights yeah. are green. Yeah. Anyway, so are you thinking when you get into your new facility, Civic Cocktail might move? Um, not necessarily. I don't know that we think that that's... I'm spoiled. Yeah, sure, I get it. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, I won't say that we, we wouldn't do uh, some civic cocktail productions there, uh, but uh, but town hall is a great space, and and for certain for certain kinds of conversations, it's really the ideal space. So uh, we've had a great relationship with town hall over the years, and we see continuing to do that in any way. So there will be uh, a mixture of those things. I, I think we definitely see doing more events within our space because we'll be able to shoot that content and turn it into TV shows and and podcasts and other kinds of distribution content, but. Um, but I, I think we'll still have a very robust relationship with Town Hall in that regard. So. Better, better public transportation to yeah. here. Yeah, better public transportation to, to in here. In this area. Yeah, yeah. Sir. We commend you for your earnings. <coughs> <coughs> Perfect timing, right? <coughs> you want some water? I have some water. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to commend you for what you've been doing in, uh, in terms of media, uh, public media, and I think it's really been great in terms of what you, that's some kind of arrangement now with the Crosscut and the CTS. And, uh, and you know, there's a lot of other changes you've been talking about tonight on the short term, but what about the longer term for the organizations like Cascade Public Media, what they could, can do or hope to do in the, uh, in the longer term future, at least you know, 10, 15 out years out? Yeah, so I, like, how do we survive in this world? You know, right, it's going to change the whole world. Is yeah, it's absolutely right. I mean, I think that's the thing we've been really uh, keenly mm -hmm. focused on is, you know, if as an organization we are wedded entirely to the distribution of, for example, content that comes from somewhere else, uh, that's going to be a hard road to go in 10, 15 years. And so I think that's where we uh, more and more feel both the value and the necessity of being more deeply engaged with our community, holding events, really trying to like be that community builder, uh, be an organization that really helps unite us, um, uh, you know, around the kinds of issues that we care about here, and really being more and more local and not as much. I mean, we will always you know, love our relationship with PBS and, and, and the program providers that we work with and continue to distribute that content to our community. But I think more and more we're going to see the importance of us really being active in our communities and really helping to elevate uh, the voices and the issues that need to get you know, this place you know, a better place to live and a better place to work. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's, it's definitely a challenging road ahead. There's no doubt about it because of how rapidly media is changing and frankly how rapidly audiences audience expectations are changing it, it really gets to that question of why do we matter why do we matter for everyone and so again for for most of us in this room we grew up on uh, a television station that was our local station and then we probably drifted away from it while we were in our teens and probably in our 20s and then as we started to you know uh, you know get our our first big jobs and get married and have a family and so forth, we started to migrate back to it. And that pattern is not necessarily going to carry forward into the future. And so that's part of the reinvention that we have to constantly be figuring out how to do in, in ways that will help us better connect with today's generation. I have a 21 year old daughter and she doesn't spend a lot of time on TV. She's watching TikTok, you know? And so, you know, what does that mean for us, you know? Yeah, her relationship to traditional brands that all of us, you know, might find value and trust in is not the same at all. And so that's a real uh, watchword for us in terms of how we think about why we matter in 10 or 15 years. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you bet. good question. <clears throat> well, it looks like, uh, <laughs> I turned it off. I've exhausted everything. Uh, is this on? No? Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, I think we've had the questions, everybody. Uh, oh, Rob, thank you again for coming. Oh, my uh, pleasure. Thank you. It's thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.